in the workplace. So over to Maddie. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly so I know where what I'm talking about. You know, being sensible right now. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Beautiful. So welcome to today tonight's talk. So today's talk is, I think it's quite an interesting subject because um, leadership is different to everybody. And so it's nice to, uh, uh, what we're just trying to open it up so everyone can talk about their experiences or what they would expect from, a, from someone in you know, a leadership role. And if, they're, if you're already in a leadership role, what kind of um, learning from like what we need to do to improve as well, because we always need to learn from our experiences. So the first part that I'm going to talk about first is my thoughts about a good and bad leader. Now, within my role, I work in, um, I've worked in health and social care and I've worked in um, retail and hospitality. So I have been, have had a boss, I've been a, had a boss and I've been a boss. And so I've got some ex little bit of experience of different kind of leadership. So in my first, in my first kind of present job that I first ever had, and um, my leader was very interesting. He was, um, he was um, American guy that was gonna, it was coming over and he was managing a team. And, you know, I was very, um, when I was, I was quite young and I told him, I said, I'm, you know, when I employed me, I'm dyslexic and blah, blah, blah. And his words were, you shouldn't have got the job because you're dyslexic. <laughs> I was like quite surprised. Um, and then, and then, you know, because of being that, some things that took time for me to take on board and stuff. But then when I spoke to, I did go speak to HR. I spoke to the person who recruited me as well and explained the situation about, because you employed me. So they were, we already knew and stuff like that. Um, and went through the right channels. And unfortunately, that manager was dismissed from the kind of, you know, what he said, number one was a role. And the way he was like, I, can't, I don't know how to manage her. You know, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, and so that was very interesting. So that company was very good at recognizing and trying to support me as an employee and then trying to look at the right, the right kind of leader to support me in my role. And I did stay in that role for a while. So that was very good at that. Um, then I moved on to working in a local authority kind of in another role. And that was very good as well, because that was a lot of being as diverse, I'm more, as you can see, I use my hands sometimes. I use my body language to describe things, things like that. And so, like, but I'm not the most wonderful person for writing it on a piece of paper to explain to them what I've already told you by verbally. Um, so with that, they did um, support with um, access to work. And I got a system to help me read the programs. I, it, then it was called Dragon. I don't know Dragon is still around. We had Dragon and then Read and Write Pro, that one as well. So I could dictate what I was trying to express and stuff like that. And so that was really great, you know. And But my boss or manager at the time really took the time actually with me and sat down with me and was like, so wants to know you know how my brain ticks because my brain doesn't you know our brains as a nice direct doesn't tick like I would say what they call normal people because our superpower is completely opposite and people don't know how to handle that superpower sometimes you know but this manager did sit down and really kind of like understood my well kind of understood my brain because I don't understand my brain sometimes neither so that was really interesting so I had a, so that was a good, oh, I was just looking at the comments and then, uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for responding. So Dragon is still available, but now is Windows only. Oh, okay, that's changed. See that, that now I'm saying my age of how old I was since Dragon has been around, because I know that's moved on to a new, a new thing. Um, so moving on to the next slide is, have you, can you see the, this thing, what's on my screen still? The steel still, okay, cool. So what type of leadership I want to put down that is, a, is around? So as you can see, I do apologize because on my screen, it says something a little bit different. It's technology, but we're in. So 
there's different types of leadership that are around that. As you can see on this statement up here, it's about what a leadership should be like and do. And there's two types. There's a formal one and informal kind of management and stuff that that I found is out there um, that are around. So the next slide on... Sorry, guys, but no wrong direction. Is that this? Good? Yeah. So this is what like um I I feel a good leadership should be, and that is someone who empowers people, leads to change, shares a vision, and inspires the people, because this what makes right. a great leader. Um, that I feel it needs a good leader and stuff. But then again, there's the other elements as well that it need to be is understanding and like emotional bit emotional intelligence. I think they do need to know as well. In your previous slide, uh, Maddie, you're yeah. talking about informal leadership. You're saying informal leadership is often better. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Why? Why? Let's get rid of this. If we could get back to that slide because it's a really useful slide. Bear with me a moment. Um, due to the fact of technology, and I am not very good on this thing at all. No. So it seems like you're just going in the wrong direction. Yeah, it just... is. It won't let me go back. There we go. Uh, click on your first bit, and then, yeah, that's it. And then click open the it back slides. up. Click on the actual slides. There we are. And then turn it in back into the shared screen. Yeah. That's it. Perfect. Guys, I am, as you can tell, very <laughs> new to technology. <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> so you're talking here about two main types of leaders, and you talk about formal leaders here, and then you talk about informal leaders. And can you just expand on the informal leaders? Because that's actually what neurodivergent people tend to be. Mm -hmm. So informal internal leaders are more of they want to get to know their colleagues a bit more in detail and understand how they function, I feel. And we're able, as me as a leader, as I was an informal leader, kind of that. So I did so I led how I led my how I led my team. So when I worked in retail, they were very surprised because my turnover team never turned over very quickly because I was kind of a person that would take that time to get to understand what makes them tick and how I can get the best out of them at the time. Because all of us, you know, some people you need to be um, very direct and very tell them. And some people you have to be creative and let them come to it themselves. And some people you've just got to write a note and they do it. And I, I say the basic ones because that's how some, I know there's other, there's a lot more. But that's how I would kind of like engage and manage and always they have other elements of understanding something a little bit of them that's personal, that that help because then they know that you actually care about them but not being too far I'm like the chum and their best friend that wasn't the mission it's about understanding how they work and how to get the best so we did I my the team that I had was and um, they all left when I left um the team was very kind of like we knew how to work we worked together really well. When we had busy periods of so working in retail, Christmas time is a busy period. We need to be quick, you need to be fast, but you need to work as a team. And so in that leadership is like, I was able to stand back and um, I had to stand back and kind of be the kind of like the face of the customer for a bit. And my team is still doing a great job in the way they were managed. So I put the people in the right place, what their strengths were. I could see their strengths and put them in where they needed to be. Um, then that's how we got better results and great sales. But I've been to other stores when you can tell them that they're if you're you're a manager or you're leading, you're not listening to your team and you're putting them in the wrong places and they wonder why it's not working and they all want to leave. You have to so it, you know, and it was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure when you see people grow as well because in front of you at the same so time. So it's leadership by negotiation. Yeah. In a nice way of negotiating, oh. in, in that kind of way of negotiation, yeah. So I used to always, no, I didn't negotiate, and um, I will, and I'll, and I always think it's about understanding them as a. I always understand them a per, as a person individually. I always wanted to know them individually, to build them to be whoever they become. Because the people that I built, so you know, come as a sales assistant when they used to come and work in retail, and then one girl come as sales assistant, she's my assistant manager. 
And then after um, I stepped and moved on to another role, she became the store manager. So growing that as a leader, I brought her. The main thing is to bring them with you. You know what I mean? You want, I always believe that you should train someone to be you in the future all the time. And don't be precious because that's the important stuff because I'm, we're not always going to be there forever. So I always think like that and always find things. But that's, but that's not always the same for everybody. I'm not saying that. That's how I work as a leader and things like that. So, so, thank so you. A, No, thank you very much for the question. It's beautiful. Now I went in the wrong direction again. I've talked about this slide. So guys, <clears throat> it's over to you. It's kind of two questions that I would like you to, uh, to have a think about. I know that you've already had this question sent out to you as well. So um, I hope you had time to have a think. So with this one, what are your thoughts about leadership, okay? And what are you looking for within your boss or manager or basically a leader and stuff? Now, I know some of you are employed, but then some of you may be self-employed as well. But you can go by your own kind of experience and just like, just make disclose as well, is that with your experience, make sure, I, I want to make sure that um, what you share is that you're, what you're comfortable with. Okay, so share what you're comfortable with as well. I said because um, this is being recorded and it will be going on. And I, you know, I don't want to affect you in any way. So just want to say that as well. Okay, so who would like to go first? Who <laughs> <laughs> to stop the share, Maddie? Yep. I don't like my laptop. I don't like my <sighs> Can we have the questions in the chat, please? I don't yeah. want to take a photo with them. Give me a second. I'll just before she takes it off. There we go. Okay, let me use my mouse. Started. I can't stop the share. It won't let me come off. For some reason. Do a little exit button in the corner somewhere. It won't let me do it. For some reason. Just, just, just um, click on the green button to stop the share and what I'll do is I'll start sharing the slides for you. Thank you. I think that's been my problem. <clears throat> and you've got two hands up as well so I've already got the hands up. Okay who would like to go first while we're dealing with taking the share down? <laughs> Linda do you want to go first? Yeah do you want to go first? I'm happy to go first. Can you hear me? We can we can. Yeah um uh I think it's very interesting that you've you, you're focusing on leadership mm -hmm. um and I found you're talking about building a team finding people's strengths and that reminded me of the best managers that I had um I worked with um children's services and teamwork was vital um it's a lonely world out there if you're working on your own um recognizing individual strengths i think that you highlighted that in your discussion as well that's key to leadership if you put somebody in a role that they're going to struggle with then you know you, you're you're identifying them as failing you, and you're wanting them to be something that they're not so i think it's so important when you identify someone has a strength to mm -hmm. go with that strength but where they have a weakness as part of a team you create a situation where that, that is covered as well. Mm -hmm. And that's how we used to work. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you gave thought to each task and what was actually going to happen. And for me, that was the best manager that had a, a global view of what was going on in the room, understanding each individual, and then knowing what was required for each task that needed to be undertaken. And then not trying to micromanage it and you know allowing people to grow and develop um and to manage situations where perhaps somebody was struggling and enabling them to say they're struggling mm. there's a huge fear now of being seen as a failure and you know i'll be next on the list for redundancy or all those anxieties a manager can handle that and say you are where you are let's get you somewhere else mm -hmm is somebody that will grow and develop a team. If they come in and they're critical and they're hurtful, um, slightly on the bullying side, you know, comments, not necessarily as open as you should never have got the job, but why can't you do this? You know, um, just take somebody's self-confidence away. 
and and then leave them deflated and ignores all the things that they can do. So I think for many neurodiverse people, you rapidly become the sum of the things that you can't do rather than the things that you can. So for me, a manager who is good, and I had some excellent managers, knew what I could do and really, really enabled me to do that so that my confidence grew and that I felt that I could do things. So that, that for me is what an excellent leader is. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, is it Andrew next? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, Andrew next and then Sadia. Okay, yeah. So I've had experience of both um, good managers and bad managers. And I've been working now for 24 years in a variety of different settings, different roles. Um, and like yourself, Maddie, I worked in retail for five years. Um, we had a particular manager who did everything kind of from day one, even before I was diagnosed with any kind of disability to make that adjustment. So, for example, you know, I would work on the customer service desk because I like working with people, general with inquiries. And then when we got a new computer system to help the customers when they were dealing with returns, glass loans, things like that. I tested it and ensured even back 20 years ago that we had this like a mini screen ruler on the system that it made a big difference to everyone. Um, in terms of it was blue, which is blue is one of one of the colours we use with our dyslexic students quite often um, in the education market. But also a good manager would be like that. You know, they would want to try and get to know and have that positive impact. My first manager happened to be dyslexic and you would go to her. She would always be looking at the bigger picture, always, even if she was busy on her, uh, you know, coffee break, something like that. She would just say, oh, are you OK? If you needed anything being there but also kind of getting people to kind of move forward. So she kind of gave the opportunity to train to be a supervisor for a long time ago. And then I was doing the customer service desk. And then once she was off one Saturday and I had to look after all the tills in, in Sainsbury's. This was a long time ago, but being able to kind of use the skills that I'd learn and to move forward. But other managers have been like, oh, you have this condition, but you can't do that. And rather than seeing that, you know, I'm a person, I have been diagnosed with this and this is the adjustment I need and looking at me holistically, there are some people with certain conditions who see the stereotype. So a good manager needs to say, okay, this person may have this. What can I get the, how can I get the best out of them? And, you know, I've kind of gone through a process of leaving one particular role and moving into another role and actually it's enabled me to flourish more and it works towards a strength-based approach um and and obviously kind of you were mentioning about dragon uh talk type is actually available on mac and uh, windows and it's a really really good bit of software and carescribe are based in bristol and they're like my the company i work for they're also a social enterprise and they are run by neurodivergent people and that's why they're good at the job. Oh, thank you so much. That's very great information. Thank you. Sadia. Hi, Maddie. Hi. Um, yeah, so I've got a few things down here. Um, and um, so one of them is actually quite similar to what Linda said about um, valuing um, your employees' strengths. So just to give an example, um, something that a manager, a good manager did, um, a couple of years ago uh, towards me was she recognized that I had a lot of knowledge in one particular area which was to do with housing and homelessness and because she was um, also an area manager so one of her other team members from a completely different team who I didn't know of I didn't know the individuals that worked there but one of their new members needed some advice around um, putting in a homelessness application and also challenging a local council authority. So she she linked me up with her. She said, Sadia, could you give this person some advice? And um, I remember that really perked me up and it kind of boosted my confidence. So that was really, really nice of her. Um, the other thing I have here is uh, a leader should lead by example and seek to inspire others. So when I say this, it's closely linked to integrity. So if they say they are going to do something, they will do it. And it also means taking ownership of failures as well. 
and that's something I haven't seen very often but I um, saw a bit of it recently and I was quite impressed and it makes you respect the the leader mm -hmm. yeah Thank you so much that is great no really useful and um, I'll take that on board as well <laughs> so, <laughs> definitely um it's the next yeah <laughs> hi thank you yeah I think um I'm going to kind of go back to the beginning with it and say you know leader you need to kind of know how to be a leader and sometimes I think um we end up in roles we haven't necessarily had the training for it and it's kind of training on the job as we go along and you learn by your mistakes and everything. But um, yeah, I think definitely, you know, how how to be a leader. And sometimes it's even, you know, does that person want to be a leader? Um, maybe they're leader by default or something. Um, so I, I would kind of say it, it, you need to kind of know, know what it is to be a leader, know how to be a leader. Um, and if you are not sure as you're going along, you need to have people who you can talk to as well about what leadership is all about. Um, well, not, you know, the, nobody has all the answers, but, you know, you need to kind of be able to, to have your um, kind of um, uh, group of people who you can go to to help you to, to dis kind of figure out some difficult situations and and know how to 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 be that leader that you you know you would want and you and you know your your the staff want as well no very true thank you so much okay uh, now me i'll introduce me yeah. Becky. <laughs> um, so no, i agree pretty much with everything everybody said so far and i do think i think another thing just to add in i think a good leader needs to acknowledge the fact that they don't and and does acknowledge the fact that they don't know everything and they surround themselves with people often who have got a lot of different skill sets them and they're comfortable in their own skin i've uh, say i've had very good excellent managers and I've had very bad managers and the really good managers have tended to be the ones who are confident in their own skin except that they don't know everything and actually surround themselves with experts in different fields and, and allow people to play for their strengths an example being um like obviously being neurodiverse um reading and writing is not one of my strongest points but working with uh, talking to people communicating people building relationships with people is and therefore um, my really good managers um, um well been the owners have actually acknowledged that and said well actually we want you to focus your efforts in that area and we'll bring other people in to support you and I think that that's the key like like, like Linda said let a, a, a team of people and a good leader acknowledges people's strengths and weaknesses and builds the team round round that and like uh, and like you said at the beginning of talk Maddie about the fact that you know you get to know your team and I think that's it because you're getting buy-in by being a leader you 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 getting your team to support you so you're not beating them with a stick they're doing things willingly for you because you're all in it together and I think if you can get a good leader gets everybody thinking you know feeling valued I think a good leader makes everybody feel valued regardless what your job role is it's not a hierarchical position it's actually you know we're in it together we all want to, we all want the same goal basically you're setting everybody on the same path so yeah thank you that's me thank you Rose, um, Rose has put something in the chat Rose do you want to read it out or do you want somebody I, else to read I can it? do, I can do. Um, it's just sort of off the cuff, I must admit. I've um, Anyway, uh, the best leaders, managers I've had are passionate as well as practical in equal measure. They enjoy the difference in the individuals in the, within the team, are open to suggestions and are thorough. They are humorous without being irresponsible and disciplined without being fascistic someone who looks after their own physical and mental well-being and who has their own support as a leader, someone with realistic expectations along with the capacity to inspire and motivate, someone who seeks to unify and sits on any temptation to divide and rule, someone who's likeable and earns respect though doesn't need to be liked. 
those are just free range off the top of my head things. I think that's fabulous. Yeah. That's <laughs> I've had a lot of leaders <laughs> and, I, and I've had to be a leader quite a lot. So it's sort of, it's a nice subject. Mm. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that. Input. I look forward to hearing more. I've got to jump off in a minute, but it's a nice subject. I look forward to re having the recording. Thanks again. So, guys, that's fantastic. I've got another question that I did slip into the chat um, just before Rose's one. And it's as a nervous, as a no, I'm going to a dyslexic person because I can't say that whole word. Um, what would you want from your leadership within your company? And the next question was, do you feel managers need to have training around no, no, no. Neurodiversity. <laughs> um, that's my tongue tie. That's the tongue. So, so 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 I think people have in a way answered quite a lot of the first question. Mm. What would you want from leadership within a company? People have talked about that quite yes, a lot. Okay. So uh, what you want for, yeah. like what about managers and training? Because like um I was blessed. I had one manager that, that understood and had the training around, you know, about understanding different people's learning styles. That's what I would say. And then, but other managers haven't done that. They found it a challenge. Do you know what I mean? And I've had to try, sort of teach them what my needs are kind of stuff of like, not, you know, you've told me, I know you've told me verbally something, but I can guarantee you when I walk out the door, I will forget that even if I wrote it on a bit of paper, it's not going to remind me. I need you to email me that in a second, you know, and thing I don't, you know, or actually when you, you know, the best way, to, you know, if you have a meeting, you know what I mean? Like you, you need sometimes to tell your manager what you need to get something from you. Do you think they need to be trained actually in the whole, about the whole of all of it to give them awareness? Oh. This is good. Yeah, you've got lots of hands now. I think, uh, um, so did, uh, look, I think you were first. And then, and then... <laughs> um, I'm going to say this loudly and I want to scream it. I think managers, most managers out there, most employers out there need neurodiversity training. And um, there is absolutely minimal understanding out there of the social model of disability of what neurodiversity actually means, of dyslexia, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am someone who has faced one obstacle after the other. So I know from my personal experience and from what I've heard from other people, fellow neurodivergent people, there is a lot of training to be had around how induction is done, how, um, you know, how expectation levels should be adjusted to suit the neurodivergent person, um, how reasonable adjustments need to be put in place as soon as possible. There's loads. Thank you Thanks. so much. That's great. Um, I'm completely agreeing with you, um, but we need more voices to say that as well. So thank you again. That's really great input. Um, and you next. Can yeah, you sorry. next. Yeah. Oh, can you, you're, you're on mute. I don't know if you realise. Oh, was it me next? Sorry. Oh no, no, it was Kenya next, and then uh, then you, then me, uh, and, and then Andrea. Yeah, for me, um, I think the question was, what do I want from a manager? And in uh, terms of their training, yeah, so I can't see what training do would you want managers to have? Um, what? Whatever training is available from maybe access to work and how to support um, staff. So it's it's been open to getting training from um, those that are in the know. So if there are training, if there's training available within the organisation, then it's for them to to seek it out. We often hear from Andrew the number of times that um, assistive technology changes. Yeah. So if they could be up to date with assistive assist, assisted technology. Um, and also um, the needs of um, people with um, neurodivergent conditions. That there are very various. Some just have in mind it's just autism, but it's not. And we we we're all, you know, we're all wearing examples that there are there are more than just um, one. So if they could be more um, 
they can get an overview of what all the, the various different learning abilities are and what the needs are, but more importantly, um, how to talk to somebody who has um, neuro, who's neuro, who identifies as neurodivergent and has a diagnosis. So some maybe communication training on how to talk to somebody. Maybe instead of talking down to them, you know, ask questions, you know, what are their needs and how would they like to be asked questions? Thank you so much. Becky, you're next, I think. Oh, uh, uh, I think Linda's next, then me. I'm going to say, yeah. <laughs> Everyone keeps moving around. Right? I'm gonna say, yeah, we're moving around because I because the minute I thought it was me, and then I thought, no, no, Linda, Linda literally beat me to post with about one second. So I'm happy for you to go first, Becky. No, 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 no. You, 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 you fire away. You're, you're by somebody else. You, you I, go. I, yeah, I, I just want to echo what other people are, are are saying. Really, I think um, I'm trying to pick my words carefully. Um. <laughs> As a social worker, you would have had an expectation that the environment in which you are working would have been attuned to and aware of the needs of neurodiverse people. But you have to add into that a toxic mix of huge pressure. And you're under pressure, your manager's under pressure, your colleagues are under pressure. So in an ideal world, we all support each other. And that's how social work was when I first went into the profession. Silo thinking, tick box requirements, masses of, of written communication um, took over. And so what I would be looking for from an organisation and hopefully with significant reforms that are going to come in to the NHS and social care and child care is a move away from this over recording, over anxiety about missing something. See, everything has to be recorded. If it's not recorded, it didn't happen um, to, to a world in which outcomes are measured by individuals sense of self. So if you're working with someone, they actually feel that something has happened, that something has changed. There is an outcome. At the moment, outcomes are boxes that are ticked, things done within a certain time. And, and not necessarily anything would have happened. So somebody who's neurodivergent being squeezed into that narrow field where everything that you have is lost and the things that you do have are not regarded um, so I would be looking for more, any organisation to say, we've got a precious gift here. One in 10 of the population has this way of thinking. Let's hear them. Let's listen to what they're saying. And let's be aware that some of the individuals that they're working with will also be neurodiverse. People who are marginalised, pushed to one side, find themselves on the wrong side of the law, find themselves overwhelmed by the demands of our society to everything to be written down in 17 pages. Um, you know, th there's a gift there and it's being completely ignored at the moment. So I suppose it's a plea really to management, government, governance, mm -hmm. to think that there are there's more than one way to skin a cat. Mm -hmm. There's more than one way to make a cup of tea. <laughs> it doesn't always have to be the railway tracks. <laughs> so I'm oh, plead really for diversity of thought. I'm finished. Sorry. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> no, that was brilliant. I'm gonna say I don't know if I'm really pleased to be following you because you said a lot of what I wanted to say, or, or a bit scared to follow you because you were so good. So yeah, it's a catch cat twenty two. Um, um but yeah, no, I, um, I agree with all of that, definitely. And that and that was pretty much, but probably not quite as elegantly put, but that was pretty much what I, I was going to say over the fact that when you, in a lot of organisations, you hear so often about, you know, it's not going to take you long because they don't understand it. There's no comprehensive or so we want everybody to do the same thing. You know, we... Uh, so and so does it so why can't you you've got so long to do this and all this endless writing and procedure after procedure after procedure that doesn't actually help but we need to tick a box so that's what it's done and there's a, a real lack of understanding where again what what you were saying 
that increase the knowledge for uh, for managers to understand that we we are they have a precious gift with with people who think differently. Utilize that rather than saying no. We want you to think the same way and do exactly what somebody else is doing because they've done it. Why why can't you do it in that time frame? And also, still this real lack of understanding that a neurodivergent brain thinks differently. Um, and therefore, we should embrace that. We don't go one, two, three, four, five. You know, we, uh, that that can jump that can jump around, and and say. And the other thing, which I've experienced quite a few times when I've told people dyslexic, and like I think I think different. Well, it's just an issue with reading, though, isn't it? In this day and age, that shouldn't be what the first thing that people think. You know, it should be more, and they should think. Oh, I'm lucky to have somebody like you because actually by having different people who think differently in the room, that could give me a competitive advantage because you're not going to think the same as everybody else. So, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'll, 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 pa- I'll, I'll pass over to, I can, sorry, Andrea. I, can, I, know, I know that's not how you pronounce your name, but I could just never pronounce it right. But over, over to you because you know it's you. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. Um, so, um I do think, yes, I think management definitely needs the training. I think there's still a bit of a stigma or maybe possibly a under- misunderstanding of what neurodiversity is. So people just think they know what it is, but they don't. Um, so I, I think in the past we've discussed, you know, like work passports. If you came from one company and went to the next company, you could have the reason- reasonable adjustments and the company would know that. But also, I think the managers need to understand what each neurodiverse condition is and how and everybody deals with it differently, has different struggles um, and also have very, very um, big superpowers, let's say, as we've ju- you've just said there, Becky. Um, we have like we're capable of doing so much more than people actually realize. Um, and it's finding those strengths in the managers, going back to that previous question, you know, knowing what the person's strengths are and knowing where they're struggling a bit and being able to you know help them so I think the training would be invaluable for any manager in any company that's me done thank <laughs> great okay. thank you Andy Andrew sorry yeah so I would um just like to add that from my perspective I do think it's it's something that should be made mandatory um, it's just like on the agenda within universities, all um, staff are meant to be disability trained. So when I worked for a particular university, I had uh, delivered training for the whole department, for law, psychology, uh, business studies, just to give that awareness. And in the workplace, looking at what the individual needs. And as Professor Nikki Martin would say, if you've met one person with autism, you have met one person there is diversity amongst dyslexia there's diversity amongst uh, dyspraxia there's diversity upon adhd and if you get the person on board and not just looking at the label quite often in the past people have been like oh you won't be able to do this and actually when someone tells me that i can't do something that makes me more deterministic and also people need to to get a grip there are a lot of famous people coming out into the open about, you know, in particular with autism, you know, there's been a lot of increasing thanks to Paddy McGuinness's ex, well, they're going to get a divorce, his ex-wife, or soon to be ex-wife. She has explained the impact of her autism in work and the relationship. But when people look at the strengths-based approach, working from home, yes, that may be something the manager might consider to be a reasonable adjustment, but providing the well-being support and getting people interacting, having regular meetings, making sure that there is a disability network. I mean, my union, thankfully, has got a disability group, so I get some emails from them, and thankfully they can be read through a screen reader, which is good. Um, But in terms of actually, the managers should get the training. It should be something... Um, not necessarily like on a curriculum, but you kind of get the gist of within a company. Obviously, the Equality Act has been going for, what, 14 years now. It was 2010. Obviously, before that, the Disability Discrimination Act 1995. So we do need to, to kind of get on board. And if someone doesn't know, get them on a future loan course or have someone come in. Access to work can provide training around a range of conditions and... You know, things are improving. And thankfully, my local MP got the waiting time in this area down from six months down to 10 weeks. Thanks to a bit of uh, people talking to them, not just kind of 
shoving bits of paper. Anyway, I'm going to be quiet because I can talk and talk and talk. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Andrew. That was very, very useful information and stuff, actually. Thank you. Um, is it? Alicia. No, it's... Um, um, yeah, Alicia. Sorry. Thank you very much. Sorry. Do you apologise? Hi, everyone. Um, hope you're having a great evening so far. Um, I actually think that uh, management definitely needs to have training on neurodiversity. But um, a question that I have is that does the trainer need to be neurodiverse mm. um, at least to set the tone um, of uh, because sometimes you've got to be um, it. <laughs> Yeah. to be able to, to tell people what it you know what it, it's all about and uh, or at least give a little drift you know I mean drifts <laughs> I can't say what I'm trying to say it's a really good point Alicia it's a yeah. really good point yeah and um be, I only say that because being able to encourage um reinventment someone who who is moving up or mm. trying to move up um, and the complexities of that um, uh, because sometimes there can be a lot of miscommunications um, um, a lot of misisms, <laughs> and I feel like um, the barriers can be um, broken down because um, uh, you can see the barriers more and um, also, um, good communication skills, good listening skills, um, and also to encourage um, reinvention within the same environment um, towards growth in every way and um, being able to um, understand a symphony to, um, of the group to be able to get the best out of everyone individually and as a group um yeah so that's just just my input thanks no, thank you no. this is all great stuff really is thank you everybody um Linda's next yeah back to Linda let me yeah sorry to interrupt again it, it's just something that Andrew said that I um didn't talk about is the fact that I've had very positive experience with um, disability networks within major organisations. Um, I always felt that it was a shame that we couldn't get managers involved. Um, and uh, towards the end of my time, um, the support that I got from that disability network was diminished because it was felt that the manager I had felt that it was a, a jolly, a bit of fun, a bit of time out of work. Um, and so I think that disability networks are very helpful. They really require management involvement. They need to, they require an understanding. They require and understanding that there's no hierarchy of need. So um, within that group, we had individuals who had uh, issues with their sight, issues with their hearing. Um, you know, one it, it was a one size fit all, fits all sort of situation, but there was no hierarchy of need within that. But managers had a tendency to not necessarily see neurodiversity. They'd look at you and think, well, what's the problem? Um, yet, yeah, if they saw somebody with a, a dog, then they recognised that they were blind, but they still didn't stop them from feeling that that wasn't acceptable. So management needs to be involved to understand language, understand perspective, and understand how an organisation's vision and mission filters down into how we actually treat people. And that was missing when when I was working before. Um, so I, that that was something I wanted to put in there because it needs to be integrated. It needs to be whole. You can't just have a trainer come in, teach a load of managers, and what do you do with that? And if you monitor people and mark them and tick boxes, that's defeating the object of the exercise. So it's about that integration, that understanding, and that seamless 
acceptance of difference that we're looking for. So I just wanted to add that and disability networks worked could really, really be the anchor from which all of that could be created, in my opinion. Does that make sense? Thank it you. Mm -hmm. Which again leads quite well because I, uh, that actually leads me really well onto what I wanted to follow on to from yours and what Alicia said with regards to. Um, I, I went on a talk the um, earlier on this week. It for it was like an, an um, it, for International Women's Day and it added a lady from a world leading um, engineering company and she was the EDI director. Now she was saying, um, ties in what you were saying, Linda, with regards to if you want that real buy in that connection, you, they need to feel it. I think that's the thing. It's about putting them putting themselves in the person's shoes and really understand it from their viewpoint and. And that's where, where I think we often struggle because they can't, they don't, they don't understand and they don't feel there's no um, emotion. They've read it, they've been told it, but they're not truly connected. And I don't know if this is possible to do. I can't see why it wouldn't be for neurodiversity. But what they said had been their most successful thing is using virtual reality. And what they'd done because it was in, it was for uh, for Women's Day, was um, they set a virtual reality headset up and got a woman. What they got the you walk in, you put the headset on, and we could do it for hours. Walk into the room, into a boardroom full of all men, and currently in the headset, you are in a white man, middle aged man's body, which is the typical thing for uh, construction and engineering. Then, and you you talk and everything and interacting and you're seeing how the rest of the people in the room are interacting with this middle-aged white man then it changes and you you go into the body of a black young woman right and then she says similar sort of things and it shows the facial expressions and how people uh, the experience that she would have as a uh, uh, or you because basically you're feeling it what you're wearing the virtual headset the feelings and everything that she would get so it's putting the person in them shoes well, if you did the similar sort of thing for somebody who's neurodivergent and actually how difficult it is for them in a meeting when you say, can you just write some notes or people are talking or can you just read this off the uh, the PowerPoint presentation? Well, no, I can't because I don't know what them words say, you know, and and so maybe a virtual reality headset so the person then feels it because I don't know if anybody else has used virtual reality, but whenever you do anything on that, when you when you watching it or doing anything, you really feel that you are that person because it it do, must do something with your brain. So maybe we could do something like that. I don't know if it's possible. I'm just took it out there. Good idea, perfect. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. It's a massive. That's a, yeah. that sounds like a really wonderful idea, actually. You know, put a headset and go like, now. I want you to be that. Put it on and like now try and read that. Pardon? Like, you know, like no, no, but like make it modelled and seeing mm -hmm. or even just that thing that it being in the room and stuff. That's fantastic. That's really great. Thank you so much. So I've got another there's, there's um, some comments in the chat, Maddie. So one comment is from D. Thank you so much, my love. Um not do you want to read your comment out? Um can I find it? Yeah. Um yeah, I was thinking it's um yeah, start with the managers with um training in neurodivergence, but the whole team has to be really clued up about it to make the environment comfortable for everybody and um yeah I think that's that's it really no thank you no it's still great input and Andrew no and Andre I'm so sorry I'm the same I really struggle <laughs> people always get my 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 name mixed up with Andrew um I, I personally think as well it's a bit like what D said HR should be trained I think we've all been in situations where the manager hasn't understood you and then you're brought in maybe for a meeting and you're in HR, you know, HR sitting there. And we all know we can't always think on the spot. You know, if you're put on the spot, that thinking and trying to come out with answers. Um, so if you weren't, if your manager wasn't understanding, then hopefully somebody in HR would understand and you could go to them and talk to them about it. It's, I think sometimes there isn't always you don't always have that person to actually talk to. So it's having a lot of people trained and so you can actually go and have a talk with somebody before, if it's not, you know, if it's your manager that you're you're struggling with. Thank you so much for that. Can you? You're on mute. I think there's a slight time delay because the last time she seemed to yeah. took a couple of minutes with the 
Oh, I think we may have lost. She's gone off screen. Can you can you unmute? I don't think she can hear us. Okay, well, I'd suggest you move on, Maddie. Okay, so I'm moving to the next question. Do you want to put the question into the chat for me, please? Um, do you want to go to your um slides or what? Yes. what do you want to do? I love it. Do you want to go? Okay, I'll put the question in the chat. This is like, this is... We've done that. So, okay. the next question is, guys, is like, I, this is kind of like a little bit for me and a little bit for, like, in the future person. This so, is the question. The okay. question is what, about... What guidance would you give a new leader, yeah? Yeah. So the question, yeah, look at me. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, we can't see the screen, but it has gone in the it has gone in the chat. It's just appeared in the chat. Okay. okay, I'm sharing the screen. There you are. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Kathy, yeah. now we're doing for time because I'm not sure what time it ends. Because I know you're very always uh, with me helping chair. I know you're always keen with the time. What we what yeah. we're looking at uh, the time. Another, another ten minutes, okay? Perfect. Thank you. We're doing well, people. So this question. This is for you guys. So what guidance would you give a new leader starting in their job? So like, if you had the opportunity to meet your leader before, they'll start their role in the team and they've got you wonderful people in the room that you've got what I've got right now or you with your superpowers because they are superpowers. Um, <laughs> what was it on how to support you? How would you want them to support you? So this is be interesting, you know. Thank you for unsharing. Thank you so much. Oh, that is over to get under. Um, I think in terms of um, advice, I would give if they're going to be leading a team of neurodivergent people, um, or a team that includes neuro neurodivergent people, is to do as much research as they can about uh neurodivergent people about you know what the their characteristics the common characteristics um go on training request for training in fact um if there is a bit of a hierarchy like if there's hr above them they should be arranging for this leader to go on training and um yeah so that's that's what i really want to say no thank you no yeah. fantastic all inputs are fantastic this evening the Maddie. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think um um I think I got this from um the talks last year as part of um national um neurodivergent um celebration week and there was a talk where um somebody said that they had this template um, and it kind of asked how people like to work, but in specific kind of uh, the, the specific questions, you know, um, which kind of gave the manager or gave another colleague an idea of the, you know, how to bring the best out, um, the best from that um, individual out into the, in the workplace. What made them? What was pref? What were their preferences were? what didn't suit them, all that kind of stuff. So maybe ask the team to fill that in beforehand. If, if writing isn't easy for them, maybe they can provide some, you know, an audio, um, a short audio or something like that um, and give the, the, the team leader an idea of the best way that, you know, the, the people in this team are going to work. And, and then maybe they can kind of, put all this together, summarize it and and have uh, a kind of a, a, an idea of of the best of how to bring out the best in in all their team members. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for your input. Hi, I think I'm hogging things. Sorry. Um what what I wanted to say about a, a leader coming into a group where you have neurodiverse individuals is not to require those neurodiverse individuals to bear their souls, to um, be an advocate for neurodiversity um, and to tell everybody, you know, be the oracle. 
they're one individual with one set of issues, creativities, whatever. Um, but they shouldn't be asked to be the spokespeople for disability and, and, and all of those things. You can't just shove everything on them. I think it's about requiring the whole team to educate themselves, to ask questions if they need to, to accept that sometimes people might not want to answer those questions. They have a right to privacy. Um, and to when you see somebody who is struggling with something, to not condemn them and not to use it as a sort of one-upmanship. So you sort of be aware of how it can impact on the dynamics within a group of people. Oh, they can't do that, they're useless. Or, you know, oh, did you see this? You know, and not even down to making a cup of tea. You know, you, you know, this woman's useless. She can't even make a cup of tea. And to be aware that those dynamics are happening and make sure that they don't get out of hand. So it, it's it's normal management making sure that there is a balance in the team, making sure that work is equitable and fair, and that if people do have issues, there is an environment in which they can talk about them. So often, I think I've read it in the, the chat as well, people don't say they're neurodiverse because they're so scared, they're so frightened. And so you, you are managing quite a dynamic you know if, if somebody came in and, and said to a manager uh, you know I'm, I'm a black worker and I'm terrified of everybody that I work with you'd be asking questions about that organization quite rightly but if a neurodiverse person came in and sat down and said to a manager I'm terrified of everybody that I work with they have a tendency to blame the neurodivergent person so I would be looking from a manager to have openness creativity sensitivity and thought don't jump to conclusions. Be aware of what's going on. That's, that's me again. I'll shut up now. No, thank you for your input. It's really great. Sadia. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to say this earlier. So following on from like doing their research and going on, to, you know, to the um, to have necessary training, uh, they should also arrange um, needs assessment. So treat everyone as an individual and everyone should go and have a needs assessment done because research and training will teach them a lot, but they might end up treating everyone the same. Like they might assume that all dyslexic people have the same differences. Um, and, you know, we know that everyone is different. One dyslexic person is different from another. And um, therefore, they should also, you know, make sure that they, they do that one-to-one um, -one approach as well. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank Has you. anybody else got any other, any more feedback on that question? Also, just mindful of time, just doing it, uh, Catherine, oh. mindful of the time, um, because I know we'd only got 10 minutes a little while ago. Uh, have we got many more slides or many things we need to run no. through before the end, or is that the... So the last slide was that one. So number one, it's a big thank you for everybody for your input. But overall, it's been a very great session. I think overall what we that was very common, a few things very common all, all across, is I believe a, a good leader is basically understanding their team was massively getting to understanding their team across the board. Um, looking at everyone as an individual and listening to them as an individual, that was something else that I got from there as well. From the training as well, basically everybody needs to be trained from the bottom to the top about it. And I think it doesn't, have, and I think another thing is it shouldn't be just for a week that we do the training. Um, like the, you know, one of my colleagues and her job, I looked on her green shot and they did like a wonderful week presentation about it. I said, but what about the rest of the year? You know, we need to be continually within the, trying to put it within the businesses of this to be in there, to give people the confidence just to do their job well. That's all it is really, isn't it? To recognize what we support them in the best way. Um, another thing is as well, it's great to know um, when we talked about if we do want to get someone training, it do, does it have to be be someone number diverse? I think it is the best thing. I think is what Becky said about having them to be put that um, virtual screen or would work as well because I think that will really make them feel because it does make you feel what anyone feels in the situation kind of stuff and things. You know, when you're standing there as a black woman in front of loads of, you know. Okay, white business person, and you're, yeah, and it is that kind of, ooh, but you can't really see the other thing as well. So I think that's the right example. Um, there's a couple of comments that I'm just going to read out. 
Um, one is please um, it's great saying about how much great the great input from in you know, about the safe environment. Thank you so much on that one. And then, oh, do we find Kenya? Did you so Kenya? Did you have something that you wanted to say that we um, unfortunately didn't get because? Yes, um, hope you can hear me before I go off again. It was um, just to really say thank you to to the to the great presentation and the contributions um, for, from all the um, advocates, um, our colleagues, and just to add about the systemic approach. So yes, we're, we're thinking about the new manager and our colleagues, but it's also to think about other departments around like occupational health. You know, what are their reports? You know, what, you know, what, are, what, are the, what have been the needs expressed? by staff that have gone in, maybe they've been off sick because of, of being bullied or other, you know, other um, um, re reasons, but just to get a report from occupational health and also training. I found in many of my jobs, though managers were trying to, to be supportive and they'll direct me to IT to um, uh, install the, um, the software, things always went wrong. Um, they would have a go at installing it, not know how to do it and leave it. And I would be left to always be the one um, trying to follow up. So it's just adding a few um, extras in like that. And I wasn't sure whether they've been covered because when I, when my um, system disconnects, um, I, I feel as if some of, some of these things might have already been covered. But just to say again, it's been a really fantastic um, talk. I've really benefited quite a bit and there's quite a bit there that I would use in my work here in Rwanda. So thank you very much. Very thank you. No, it's very your input is was important as well as anything. And that's very true actually. It's made me flex as well and think that actually it's quite a big department as you mentioned. It is occupational health that you forget because that impact. And I think it is IT, I have to admit when you do get your um, have your assessment done and stuff like that and you get the equipment, they get someone out, but they don't always train the IT guy that has to maintain that equipment or that software on the system that, you know, because IT are like, I don't know. Well, you must know because it linked, you know, but they don't know. So it is that needs training in that area too, actually. It's not just, you know, it's a lot of areas and stuff. I think. But I think this is a great conversation that we need to go on, we can go on for a while, but it's a conversation that we need to have with more people as well. So um, once again, thank you for this evening. Thank you for everyone's input and coming on this journey of, of understanding leadership and stuff and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you very much, buddy. Bye, all.